Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar hosted by Welcoming America titled Unaccompanied Minors, Changing the Narrative and Taking Action. This webinar will feature prominent leaders and experts providing information related to unaccompanied minors. My name is George Zavala, and I'm the Western Regional Manager at Welcoming America. I'm based out of Austin, Texas. It's a pleasure to welcome you all and moderate today's discussion. Let me first start by explaining a little more about Welcoming America. Welcoming America is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that leads a movement of inclusive communities becoming more prosperous by ensuring everyone belongs. We believe that all people, including immigrants, are valued contributors and vital to the success of our communities and shared future. Through the Welcoming Network, composed of over 275 local governments and nonprofits, we work to change systems and culture by providing communities the roadmap they need to create welcoming policies and share new approaches to inclusion that creates an environment where everyone can truly thrive. Some objectives for today's webinar include highlighting key policies, describing who unaccompanied minors are and the implications of current policies on them, and providing local and national strategies that help change narratives, create welcoming policies and programs, and activate community members in supporting unaccompanied minors. Please use the chat feature to enter any questions you may have during today's discussion. We will respond to as many questions as possible after the presentation and during the Q&A portion. The webinar is being recorded and you will receive a link to the recording and resources in the next few days. With that said, I'd like to introduce our first speaker for today's webinar. Margaret Saylor sits on leadership team at Witness at the Border. She co-leads team TLC NYC, a grassroots group supporting asylum seekers and immigrants in New York City. After retiring from her career as an educator, Margaret has been a volunteer advocate for children, immigrant rights, the rights of girls and women, racial justice, and climate justice. Thank you so much for being here, Margaret. Thank you, George. So uh, Witness at the Border was uh, started in 2018 um, at uh, Tornillo, Texas, which I'll get into later. And we're going to start on the next slide by seeing a short video of a uh, protest that was held in El Paso, Texas this year, April, 2021, at the Fort Bliss uh, military facility where there is a um, emergency intake site for children. So we can look at the video now. Walk with us as we walk for the children, for the families, for the lost lives in the wilderness. Let our heels begin to heal the brokenness of our militarized border our inhumane and racist immigration policies. Let our steps stir us and send a message to our government. We will not give up this struggle for just migration. We will not give up the struggle for keeping families united. It means bearing witness. It means walking together. And so know that there are children waiting to be reunited with families. There are children that are being expelled right now to Ciudad Juarez. There are people all over in tremendous amounts of suffering because I frankly believe that we haven't had the courage, the creativity, and the conviction to do better. Thank you, George. So who are unaccompanied children? Um, just a brief background, the US Department of Health and Human Services is responsible for the temporary care of unaccompanied children, UC, um, and they, send, they have their Office of Refugee Resettlement, ORR. The children who cross the border are first encountered by the Center for Border Patrol, CBP, 
often staying in their detention centers, which are clearly not for children before they go on to the ORR shelters. There are Office of Refugee shelters all over the country. The emergency intake sites, similar to the uh, one that you just saw with the protest in El Paso, Texas, well, that is an emergency intake site. They're different from the regular ORR shelters because they're emergency, right? So they're big tents filled with tents filled with kids. They are unlicensed by the state. Uh, it's difficult for people to really see what's going on inside. And we have um, protested against them. If you haven't heard of the Flores Settlement, it was a 1997 agreement for standards of care in all ORR shelters, including that children should not be in these facilities longer than 20 days. But that sadly is not always the case. In fiscal year 2020, uh, about three quarters of the children referred to ORR were over the age of 14, 68% were boys. The countries of origin, most were from Guatemala, 46%, El Salvador, 14%, Honduras, 25%, and a small percentage from other countries such as Cuba, Venezuela, Haiti, et cetera. Uh, most of the children from Guatemala are of indigenous origin and speak languages other than Spanish. As of just this week on Monday, there are now 10,834 children across all of the um, health and human services uh, facilities across the country. So of course that's far less than what you saw in the video in April, there were over 22,000. And there, are, there were as of Monday, over a thousand in CBP custodies. Next slide. Our organization, Witness at the Border, is a grassroots all-volunteer effort started by Josh Rubin from Brooklyn, New York. When he went to protest in Tornillo, Witness Tornillo was started to protest the emergency intake tent facility in the desert outside El Paso, Texas. Huge tents, as you can see, with children who stayed far too long. That facility closed in January 2019. Next slide, please. Next, we focused on the tent facility emergency intake site in Homestead, Florida. Another problem with the emergency sites is that they're extremely expensive, something like $750 a day to house children when they ought to be quickly reunited with their families and sponsors. And you can see how crowded this facility was. It closed in August of 2019. Next slide. Our group then uh, in 2020 began focusing on the Remain in Mexico policy, which was um, started under the Trump administration and forcing people who came to our country to seek asylum to get a date for their court appearance, but then go back and live in Mexico, many of whom had nowhere to go. And so they were living on the streets and uh, homeless encampments popped up such as the one you see on the left in Matamoros, Mexico, across the bridge from Brownsville, Texas. Huge, over 2000 people were there uh, when I was there in, in early 2020. And you can see the tent courts on the right there where people come before a judge, um, not, not like a regular court. Next slide. What we were asking at the April um, March for the Children that you saw on the video, we were asking for children to have homes, not detention, that we end the Title 42 expulsions that you'll hear more about from the other speakers, that the government stop separating children from non-parents. If they come across with a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle or a sibling, that they should be able to remain with them and not be separated and put in detention. And most importantly, that the children be released in a timely manner because any form of shelter that is not their family is, is detrimental. Next slide. Here's some of the news of things that have happened in uh, July. Lawyers raise concerns over amount of time migrant children spend at Albion intake shelter. That's the one in Michigan that uh, I believe is where we're now um, sheltering Afghan children while we're waiting to see where they can be placed. 
Three complaints were filed against the unaccompanied migrant center at Fort Bliss, the one we were protesting. And just this week, a bipartisan report was released exposing the risks of deliberate ignorance, uh, looking at problems in ORR care that need to be fixed. Next slide. These are three um, nonprofits, if you haven't heard of them, that work to help reunite unaccompanied children with their families and sponsors and hurry things along since it often takes a long time for the government to um, reunite them. So each step home, Project Lifeline and Vecina help to get the children placed as quickly as possible. Next slide. Here are the numbers. Today, as I said, we have 10,834 total in the HHS system. And you can see um, the numbers below are children in the emergency intake sites. As of this Monday, there are just 262 left at Fort Bliss. We hope that they will all be reunited with their families and sponsors as quickly as possible. And there's some other numbers there for the other intake sites. Next slide. Finally, I just wanna say that uh, Witness at the Border is part of the Welcome with Dignity campaign. Over 90 organizations have come together, committed to transforming the way the US receives and protects people forced to flee their homes to ensure they are treated humanely and fairly. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret, for that informative presentation. I would now like to introduce you all to our panel for today's webinar. Uh, Mario Bruzzoni is a policy analyst at the U.S. Committee for Refugees and Immigrants. His policy portfolio focuses on unaccompanied children in the U.S. and regional protection for migrants of all ages throughout Latin America. He has published substantially in academic journals uh, and holds a Ph.D. in geography from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Marissa Limon Garza is a native uh, Fronteriza with over 18 years of experience engaging multicultural communities through the lens of advocacy, education, strategic communications, and community involvement. She currently serves as Deputy Director of the Hope Border Institute, a social justice nonprofit organization working in El Paso, Texas, Ciudad Juarez, Mexico, and Las Cruces, New Mexico. And finally, Jennifer Podgul is an international human rights lawyer and expert on child migration. She has authored articles, handbooks, and reports and presents regularly as an expert at various conferences, briefings, and professional trainings. Jennifer provides technical assistance and education to policymakers and testifies before Congress on issues related to migrant children. She is the Vice President for Policy and Advocacy at Kids in Need of Defense. Just a note for everyone, after our panel discussion, we will take questions from the audience um, as we've been taking them throughout this call. So we are monitoring the chat and the Q&A function. Um, and we'll now turn off the slide function so that we can have a dialogue with these speakers. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I guess the first question that I'd really like to ask is directed at Marissa. Um, and it's just a general kind of uh, opening question around, has the migration of children changed in the last several years? And how has Title 42 really affected this migration? Thank you, George. And thank you to all of um, the other panelists for being part of this important conversation and to all the members of the audience who joined us today. It's important for us to put some things into some context. So historically, migration to the southern border of the United States is was mostly uh, the work of adults and the work of, of men in particular. And all of our infrastructure and the US response has really been one of, of deterrence, uh, militarization and enforcement for, for many, many years and for many administrations at this point. And so in 2014, when we started to see a dramatic increase in the number of unaccompanied children arriving, mostly from Central America and Mexico, that was a dramatic shift for the United States and has, has held true beyond to this date of seeing many more children on the move. Um, a quick note just on, on the concept of family as well and what it means to be accompanied or unaccompanied in the eyes of the US government and in the eyes of, of a community. And so many of these children that we're talking about, young ones here, 
uh, come from family units, just like me and you. And uh, oftentimes these are loving communities of people that go beyond a mother and father and siblings, include grandparents, include cousins, include people that might be known as comadres and compadres and vecinos. And all of these people make up a family. And so it's very interesting when people are on the move and, and on a migration journey, and then they're confronted with, with some of the systems that are put in place to make sure, uh, oftentimes for, for the safety of young people, but also kind of some of our rigid bureaucracies don't always recognize um, this concept that's more global of familia. And so I, I want us to think critically about what it means to be an accompanied, yes, in, in this true sense of the word from a legal framework within the United States immigration policy, but then also through a sense of what it means to be a human family and to be part of a group of people that are on the move. And so this really radically changed how our response would be as a country. And it's really drummed up a lot of a lot of challenge. And we've seen how immigration policies over many administrations have impacted some of the most vulnerable migrants, which are the unaccompanied children. The Title 42 policy being in a prime example of this. This is a policy that was begun during the last administration uh, as a in, in face, many, many would say what it, the attempt was to use COVID. Uh, 19 as a pretext to really cut off the right to seek asylum, really cut off the opportunity that people have to seek protection at the southern border. And this was even including children. And so what it looked like in practice and what we've seen here in my hometown of El Paso and in Ciudad Juarez is really disturbing um, efforts to return people to places of violence and places that they do not um, have a permanent home and do not have a shelter, which, which is northern Mexico. And in many ways, migrants um, themselves, adults, uh, are already incredibly vulnerable to violence, to persecution, to assault. We have documented reports of this and, and many accounts of what happens when people are expelled without any kind of protection and support. And so if you can imagine what that experience is like for an adult, it's even more dramatic for a child. And so it's incredibly important that we think about what our current U.S. immigration policies are and how they contribute and actually help develop and, and are a catalyst at times for more people and more children to arrive at the southern border unaccompanied by, by, our, by our statutes and systems. And so I wanted to share that narrative and some framing, some background for us as we begin the conversation about uh, with our other experts around unaccompanied children and what's happening right now um, in the United States. Thank you so much, Marissa, for providing that context, that framing, and especially around just really humanizing this, this conversation. I think um, we see so many numbers and, and data and statistics, and um, sometimes it does get lost in translation as we're trying to figure out um, what best solutions and what ways we can activate local community members. So I really appreciate that. Um, the next question that I have to kind of continue on this uh, framing and this contextualizing is for Mario. And could you kind of explain um, what the current system um, that the government that the government provides for caring for unaccompanied minors is, um, and kind of clarifying what case management is and or isn't um, in ORR Care Network. Yeah, um, I want to first uh, echo Marisa's uh, kind words. Um, I'm honored to be part of this panel. Thank you so much to um, Welcoming America for organizing it, and um, I look forward to the discussion with uh, all the experts here. So in terms of the, the sort of regular system, the one that the EISs that Margaret mentioned uh, are, are evading or getting around. The central goal of ORR care is the reunification of children and families in state, safe and stable placements that will remain safe and stable. So it really is a, a system that is supposed to reunify kids as its primary goal. And that's perhaps a little bit of a contrast with domestic child welfare systems that uh, look to the full suite of children's best interests, but also do things like individual service plans, um, to attend to, you know, the entire suite of needs that children have. Children in ORR care are provided with a number of, um, uh, you know, sort of practices that help with their therapeutic needs, their mental health needs, behavioral health needs, also physical health uh, and med medical needs while they're in the care of shelters. But on release to sponsors, the sponsors take responsibility for for the care of the child um, and for meeting those needs. So though they are met for a short period typically by experts and then um, those folks end up in, in local communities upon, upon release. 
Um, we know from a child welfare perspective that getting kids to families as quick as possible is imperative. Um, children thrive when they're with families. Uh, familial settings are best by and large um, with pretty rare exceptions. And the OR system doesn't sort of treat it um, that way. OR is very, very interested in vetting, which makes sense from a political standpoint. And, and obviously it's crucially important that kids are not sent to dangerous placements, but it takes far too long at the moment to actually uh, get kids into homes. I wanna just sort of transition very briefly before I pass it off to, one of the things that we see from a, a care provider standpoint, so my organization, the U.S. Committee for Refugees and Immigrants, we are a refugee resettlement agency. We also run a national home studies and post-release services program, um, as well as a shelter in Florida. I work in the national office in D.C. on the policy side. But from our, our sort of combined social services portfolio, we know that upon reunification, there's often a period, a, a sort of honeymoon period, where kids and family are excited to be together. They're co-imagining this wonderful new future. They are um, sort of like enjoying the new community. They're learning things. And that period uh, really means that they're, the sort of trauma that they've experienced, these longer standing needs, get suppressed temporarily and only emerge later on. And they can emerge manifesting through other sorts of fights. A common one is sort of about child autonomy, especially with older teens, where they say, hey, I was functionally an adult in home country, and now you're making me go to school. You're telling me when I can go out and not. Um, and what really that, that means in terms of maybe some of the audience here, at least who we know who signed up, is the importance of making sure that there are community-based supports available for sponsors and kids um, because that's not being provided by the government and it's not going to be uh, necessarily available through the sponsors um, who are immigrants themselves, often you know, limited English proficient, limited money, um, have their own trauma to deal with. So I just wanna sort of emphasize the importance of that sort of continuity of service uh, in order to make sure that kids have the best outcomes, but also that we're supporting, you know, really good families, family life, strong family life for immigrants of all sorts. Happy to talk about this more later on, but for now, um, I'm gonna pass back to George. And thank you all for joining us today. Thank you so much, Mario. One question that, um, that I know has come up a lot is specifically around the activation at the local level and what that looks like related to policy, related to service provision, you know, how nonprofits, how religious leaders. So kind of dialing it up a little more. I'm, I'm really curious, Jennifer, about what recommendations or what changes you've seen in policy regarding unaccompanied minor in the last year or two and how you think that policy advoc advocacy can be elevated at the local level if if there's any insights that you can provide um, on your technical assistance that you provide policymakers, anything that kind of helps our audience understand a little more um, what that looks like. Sure, thanks George, thanks everyone for joining. Um, yeah, I mean, I think when we think about these kids and we look at the media reports of them, the conversations about them, a lot of it is about their experience at the border, right? And that is a very significant part of their migration experience, but that's not all of it, right? So generally the kids are spending relatively short amount of time at the border and in federal custody before they're released to a sponsor in the United States, right? And then as Mario was talking about, you know, that's a, where a lot of, you know, really monumental things are happening to the kids. They're trying to adjust to a new home. They're adjusting to a new school, a new language, a new community. And these kids are put into deportation proceedings, just like adults are, right? So they're entering these communities with a lot of things up in the air. They don't know if they're going to be able to stay and how long it's going to take for them to find out if they're going to be able to stay in the United States or if they're going to be returned to their country of origin. So what we really need to think about is how do we best support these kids while they go through this long, arduous process of trying to find out, going, working through their immigration court case and integrating into our communities. I think the other thing is sometimes the narrative is about these kids at the border, right? And so people think about them as like, oh, they're over there, but they're living in our communities, right? And sometimes they're living for four or five years in our communities, right? While they're going through the immigration court process. So there's a lot of support that needs to happen and a lot to make sure they're integrated. And the other thing I would like to note is when children have legal representation, when they have a lawyer accompanying them through the deportation process, they overwhelmingly win their cases, right? So instead of talking about them as like these kids over here, there are kids, right? They're gonna be US citizens. We wanna make sure we're doing the best by them to integrate them so that they can be 
productive members of our communities, right? And so I think as we're thinking about what is it that they need, you know, they're going to school, right? Even though they're in deportation proceedings, they have to go to school. So schools are a great place for communities to really think about how to support, you know, making connections with schools. There's a lot of community-based organizations. Also, we're seeing a lot of progress on the state and local side as well in terms of policymakers, right? There's a lot of funding that can be directed to support these populations. Um, there's a lot of um, ensuring that they get the health services that they need and the social services that they need. So I think there's really a lot that local entities can explore in terms of how are they supporting their kids while they're going through the immigration court process. And then also once they're U.S. citizens, how do we make sure that they have all the support they need as they're growing up? Thank you so much, Jennifer. I think that really touches on one of the um, one of the ways that we really wanted to orient this conversation was around ways that that audience members, local community members, local organizations, city governments can really think about that narrative change, and that's that's an important component in in a lot of the work that that we do in immigrant inclusion, um, regardless of you know the facet or the specific. Uh, service delivery that might be offered through individual organizations. So the next question that I have is for you, Marissa, um, around how you see narrative change in building support for unaccompanied minors and what that might look like locally in, in El Paso or, you know, like, can you speak more to that narrative change and potential strategies or, or ways that you've seen that play out in the last couple of years? Absolutely. So it's, it's incredibly important when we think about um, these children, as I was mentioning at the beginning, is that they they come from families and they are hopefully going to be with some kind of family unit, whether it's their own or a sponsor here in the United States. And so this idea of, of a whole person, just like we would for any other child, really thinking about them as a whole human being and, and also more than their migration journey, that that is certainly a part of their experience. Um, and it's definitely formative, but it's also something that um, every time that I'm in a migrant shelter in Ciudad Juarez and I'm with, with young ones, I'm always uh, inspired by the fact that at the end of the day, kids are kids and they want to play and they want to run and they want to jump and they want to do what every other kid I know wants to do. And so it's important to remember that we often see the images through the media that are very uh, a graphic. We see images of kids in cages. We see images of the harshness of the border reality, which again, as Jennifer uplifted, is, is one small component of these families' realities. I think some of the things as, as we encourage people, as it makes sense and is obviously safe, but if you're thinking about a, a community care approach, it's really thinking about how to connect with um, these children as children. And so one of the most beautiful opportunities that we had here locally was some of the artwork that was recovered from um, the Tornillo facility that Margaret was talking about was an expression um, that many of the children there had about their home community, about their country of origin, and that they had about their life. And it was a beautiful testimony to the worldview that these children bring and that they have and they offer. And so I think that's something that's incredibly important to remember. And, and finally, just two more points. One is that our systems that we've set up to support um, children and, and protect them can, can be double-edged swords in many ways. And so some of the points that Maria was bringing up relate to that. And so what we've seen here locally in our last few months is the reality of what happens when, when an unaccompanied child um, transitions to adulthood and, and poof, by magic, they turn 18 and now you've aged out and all these services and perhaps protections that you had that the government has built in to support you are automatically gone, very similar in some ways to, to foster care. And we've seen what that looks like in our community with uh, unaccompanied children that, that, that got COVID-19, were taken to our local uh, facilities, our quarantine facilities operated by our emergency management. And then they, during that quarantine period, turned 18. And now the agency that had been supporting them through this time that didn't have sponsors, uh, was already like cut off and could no longer provide any service because their funding was very limited and everything ended at the time that child turned 18. And so now local community was trying to think about how do we, how do we support, how do we grapple, how do we make this work? And so it's important to think about those 
adjustments that need to be made to systems to make them more humane and to, to be very much um, holistically related to the person. Um, I, th I think that's it for right now. Perfect. Thank you so much, Marissa. Um, kind of speaking back to the, the points that you have all made around, you know, the lengthy process and thinking about the roles that, that communities really play in, in changing the narrative, taking it from a they, a them to, you know, it is children in our own communities and how we can help them. Mario, I was wondering, is, is there anything that you can speak to around some of the needs during post-release, you know, that, that, and the roles that communities can play, whether that be local nonprofits or, um, you know, different um, sector partners? Yeah, thank you so much for the question. And I'm going to try and uh, hit a couple of the questions in the chat, although we have a Q&A and a chat. So I apologize uh, if I'm not able to hit everything that is potentially valid or, or useful here. Um, I want to echo first uh, Jen's point about schools as sites of intervention. Um, because kids go to school, because they have a, a, a right to go to school, and because it's really hard to for even oppositional local governments to um, keep kids out of school. Those are really rich environments um, and full of resources and for making sure that kids, but also their parents are integrated into communities. At the same time, um, I wanna sort of caution that uh, a lot of the general research on educational success and, and outcomes for immigrant communities and, and is applicable for this group as well. And I'm gonna talk about research maybe in the second part of this question, just a second. But, um, you know, with COVID-19, for instance, we've been asking parents to do a, a lot of supplemental teaching, right, um, with digital instruction. And we're not necessarily with communities where that's a, a model that's really useful, right? So schools themselves, physical schools can be important sites of intervention because there's other services there, because you have a, a caring community, because you have lots of um, folks uh, in one place who, you know, want to do the best for your kids. But uh, as we move to sort of asynchronous instruction, that's not always been something that um, helps all kids, but it's uh, especially potentially detrimental for immigrant folks, for folks where the parents have limited uh, technological experience and where uh, parents might be limited English proficient. One sort of side note, I used to teach ESL um, in Oakland, California, and we did a digital instruction week where uh, just, and these were mostly parents who were taking night classes. Um, occasionally who would bring their students into class, their little kids. And the parents like did not understand the concept of a mouse. Like every time, every time I taught this lesson, they were like, we spent a long time just mouse cursor, right? And so while everyone has smartphones, I think that that kind of hides a, a level of, I don't want to say uh, sort of illiteracy, but we sort of assume that the use of smartphones means that people are really competent with technology. More broadly, um, just really quick, uh, there is a real lack of research-based practices, best practices for unaccompanied kids specifically. We're mostly inferring from the general child welfare system, we're inferring from foster care knowledge, we're inferring sometimes from other countries, we're inferring from knowledge about immigrant communities and immigrant children, but we don't really know this community specifically very well. That research is just not there. So for folks who work at research-based agencies, there's a huge opportunity to, to talk about outcomes and outcomes data. At this point, we have 600,000 or so UCs who have passed through the system, not all of whom are still in the US, but a, a lot of whom are. Um, and so we're not talking about a phenomenon that's gonna go away and we're talking about a really big population that's available to study. Uh, finally, in terms of sort of individuals, I just would wanna point out that there's lots of things that an individual who's interested can do in their community it's not systemic change, but will help with folks. So that is ESL teaching, that is working for food assistance, that is working in sort of healthcare access and health assistance. We know as a social scientist in social science, you know, money, health, and time are the three biggest determinants of people's well-being. And so anything that you can do to either get those to communities directly, parents and children as a family, um, or enable access to them will be really important for folks who are marginalized, um, you know socially in the US generally and by their legal status. Thank you so much for that, Mario. As we approach kind of the last um, section of our, of our panel discussion, I'd really like to kind of move it toward the future and, and hear from you, Jennifer, first about what your recommendations for policy changes regarding unaccompanied minors are or is. 
I don't know if we have, we have all day, I can probably get to all of them, but let me just kind of start at a 30,000 foot and then, um, you know, work down a little bit. I think, you know, what we need to do is start with the reframing of the system, right? This was a system that was created and developed, you know, the laws affecting this population, the legal settlements affecting this population were done a long time ago, right? And we're in a different world now, as Marisa was saying, the numbers are in you know, incredibly different than they were even in 2008 when the bill that codified a lot of protections for these kids was created. Certainly a lot different from when the Flores settlement was initially agreed to. Um, so the reality is totally different. So what we really need to do again is have another overhaul of the system for the kids and really approach it as a child protection framework rather than immigration enforcement deterrence, right? This is a population that really needs to be treated as children and have their rights respected as children. And so what we need to do is first kind of reframe how they're received, the reception at the border when they're asking for protection, right? We want to make sure that instead of being, you know, somebody with a gun interviewing the child, that you have someone who's more appropriate that has training, that understands how to do, how to have conversations with kids, especially kids who've survived the kinds of trauma that these kids have. We want to make sure then that we're able to get to the bottom of a child's story and figure out who needs protection, you know, who really needs to stay here because they don't have a safe place to go to. You know, these kids are thrust into a adversarial immigration court process where they have to prove, they have the burden on themselves to prove to the U.S. government that they need to stay here because it's not safe for them wherever they came from. Um, that's not right, right? We need to make sure that we have a system that's really going to consider the best interest of the child and think about what is the best way, where is the best permanency for this child, and what are the kinds of supports that they're going to need so that they can be safe and healthy as they continue to grow up. So it's, you know, talking about revamping the adjudication, revamping the reception. And finally, you know, the ultimate goal is no matter where these kids are coming from, we want to make sure that a child is safe where they were born, right? Where they're living with their family and their homes. We want to make sure that kids feel like that they can stay safe and that they never feel like they have to leave their communities and go somewhere else to seek safety. So really thinking about what would truly address the root causes of these kids' migration in the first place so that a child never feels like they have to leave their home. Right, that's our ultimate goal. Now, you know, these are kind of very big pictures and sometimes feel overwhelming. There's smaller bite-sized things that are starting to happen, conversations happening, and things that we want to be promoting that could be done, right? I mean, there's two bills in Congress right now, one that would mandate counsel for unaccompanied children to make sure that no child has to go to immigration court without a lawyer. Um, that's called Fair Day in Court for Kids. There's another piece of legislation called the Central American Child Women and Protection Act. Um, that's being introduced in both the House and the Senate, a bipartisan bill that would really look at the root causes of migration and try to address some um, protection measures in areas where children are coming from and coming here to seek protection. Um, Congress has appropriated money so that customs Border protection hires child welfare professionals and they're asking for protection at our borders. Um, and so there's lots of you know, small, smaller pieces that we can start to move child protection. Thank you so much for covering so many facets of, of the experience and, and really addressing kind of the, the need for, um, for solutions addressing root causes. The next question that I want to ask um, is to Marissa around, um, again, thinking about the future, if you could change one or two things in the way that we deal with unaccompanied minors, uh, what would that look like for you? You know, local, local context, your role, um, can extend beyond that as well. Absolutely. I think primarily right now, the most urgent thing for us to see happen is, is an end to the Title 42 policy, which has cut off all kind of access to uh, protections and the right to seek asylum at the southern border. It's it's something that this administration early on uh, really seemed to be open to and has doubled down um, in the reverse. And so we know that this is um, incredibly causing deep, deep harm to people and compound.
we have we have wide vaccine access. Um, our community in particular um, had had the highest vaccination rate in in all of the state of Texas, and so we want to make sure that those policies are changed. And also really rethinking really what um, that process to welcome people looks like, because oftentimes our approach, again, has been in deterrence and it's an enforcement model, which is really equipping, I think, some of the wrong people for the job. And we need to really think about how we have more humanitarian focused efforts, especially when we're thinking about the rights of children and their unique needs. Thank you so much. And I pose the same question to you, Mario. Um, any one or two things that you would change. Yeah, I, I touched on them briefly, I think. Um, so you got a little foreshadowing. The first is that there really needs to be a focus within the OR system in making sure that we have uh, speedy release. Kids spend too long in care, um, especially kids that are going to parents. It's about 40% of kids that, that they spend too long. That should be no more than seven days, even with all of the, the checks that we do now. And it's far more than that. So that's the sort of first one. The second one is strengthening um, the services and the availability of services post-release. There is a thing that OR provides called post-release services. Those are mostly bridging services and sort of parental support um, secondarily. So they say they're referral services. Here's where you can find a dentist. Here's how you enroll kids in school. Here's how you can find a legal service provider, but they're not the services themselves and they're not meant to be. Parents do benefit from them. And OR has shown a commitment to expanding those. They, their ambition is for this fiscal year that we just entered to bring it to 80% of kids and then 100% um, in fiscal 2023. Um, and they've told that to the post release service providers. Uh, historically, only about 20 to 25% of kids have got these kinds of post release services, but they're not really sufficient, right? They don't really provide the actual long-term, medium and long-term care needs um, that, that are required. And I just wanna emphasize um, again, from our refugee resettlement side, we know for kids who need significant therapeutic support, um, and particularly when kids and parents both have had severe traumas, individual therapy for kids, but that's talk therapy or another model, will not have sort of, it won't be sticky enough, will not have sort of the durable effects unless you're talking about family and group therapy as well, right? We need to address the trauma that's happened for whole family units that can be individual, that can be together in one place. But without that sort of 360 wraparound support for families, for making sure that everybody is getting cared for, um, we don't, we're not gonna see children thrive in the way that they could thrive. Thank you so much, everyone. We really appreciate your time. Um, we would like to bring Margaret into the Q&A um, discussion, and we will now be looking at some of the questions that everyone has asked um, I guess one of the first that I can think about and that I want to uh, uplift is, is everything that is going on with resettlement for Afghan uh, refugees and um, our Afghan American uh, communities across the United States. Are there um, any intersections that you can highlight around sponsorship and what that looks like um, for communities that are uh, receiving Afghan refugees? I can start and then maybe Mario wants to, to um, compliment. So, you know, we've seen, there were a lot of Afghan children who actually were evacuated to the United States who did not arrive with a parent or legal guardian, right? Some of them left unaccompanied and some of them were actually separated during the chaos of the evacuation. So the U.S. government has actually taken a little bit of a different approach to this population than they have to other populations in the past. And they've allowed some of these children, if they came with an extended family member, now this is what Margaret and Marisa were talking about earlier, they let them stay with that person instead of sending that child to an ORR facility. They did the screening um, right away at, upon reception because they have a little bit more information about these populations. Um, now, this is a practice that advocates have suggested that can apply to all children who are arriving with extended family members. So there may be best practices that we can lift up that were identified in our response to the Afghan kids that we can deal with others. Now these children are gonna be eligible for resettlement benefits, right? So some kids just were 
went to the military bases or in communities and now can be working with the refugee resettlement groups to get the benefits that the adults are getting as well. Some kids who didn't have anyone with them upon arrival who are in the ORR system, in the system for unaccompanied kids, are going through this process. The one thing we want to flag is that for some of these children who were separated, their parents may be in another country. And so we need to kind of keep an eye on how do we ensure transnational reunifications when appropriate to make sure these kids are put back together with the family they were separated from. And for others who arrived unaccompanied, we want to make sure that they're being supported um, by communities who have familiarity with the language and the culture and the religion of these kids so that they can fully integrate, as I was talking about before. But I'll stop so Mario can add what I missed. I think that was really comprehensive. I have uh, basically only small glosses for the other things in the chat. Um, I want to say that Christine is correct that Star Albion is now dedicated to Afghan UCs. Or I made a decision, and I, I, regardless of whether I think it's uh, fully correct, or I made a totally defensible decision to bring the Afghan UCs who weren't able to easily reunify into just a couple of places so that all of the sort of services, translation support, cultural support, making sure that, you know, everybody has the religious need, needs fulfilled, all of that sort of like prayer clocks, all of that sort of stuff um, are just in a few places rather than dispersed uh, among lots of agencies that maybe are a lot more familiar with Latin American um, migration. Um, and then the second one, there's a, a, a sort of local question about Arizona. Um, I would just sort of caution at this point about Afghan UCs and, and localities. One of the, there's about a thousand Afghan unaccompanied kids total at this point, um, several hundred more uh, still at what are called lily pads, these sort of third country bases. What is happening for a number of them is that they're being reunified with sponsors who are on military bases in the US. So that reunification is happening that way. Those will end up in new communities and new locations and where they're going is still largely up in the air. So we don't really have data or even something to look at for saying, hey, here's where people are, here's where they're gonna end up. Um, partially because this is, and this is maybe a, a, a critique and something to take away is that state, the Department of State and the Department of Health and Human Services are not communicating super well about Afghans. So um, I, I'm in a lot of communication with HHS or, or our policy staff about Afghan UCs. I'm generally satisfied with what they're trying to do. They may not always get it right, but I, I do believe that they're trying really hard. Um, they're often also not the decision makers. And so um, that's a real challenge right now in the Afghan situation. Thank you so much. One question that um, is asked at Margaret is, where can individuals find information about unaccompanied children in their local counties or cities? Um, is there any any leads or any any place that you would recommend people? Um, actually, someone else may know that maybe Jennifer better than I do. Um, I just wanted to say there was a question about the number of overall kids in HHS custody over 10,000 as a couple of days ago. Those are in all the different uh, detention or shelter facilities across the country. Some are large, some are small. And HHS, um, per, they send out those numbers every day and we post them on the Witness at the Border Twitter feed. If you follow Twitter, you can see them there. I don't know how to find out about in each specific community though. Maybe someone else does. Yeah, ORR publishes the data based on fiscal year, a number of kids in different counties. So you can go onto um, the HHS um, website and go to the Office of Refugee Resettlement and they have data and it's pretty interesting. They'll give you breakdowns of you know, country, countries, ages, genders, and where kids end up. Um, now, you know, there's always this tension between giving a lot of information so that communities can be supportive, but then also recognizing there's child protection and privacy concerns. Um, so there's always, you know, concern about making sure that we're not endangering a child by releasing too much information about them. But that kind of information is really helpful for communities to know, you know, how many kids are showing up here and if they're going to be in our schools, you know, what's needed in terms of funding and other supports legal representation and social services that they need so that they can prepare to welcome them. Perfect. Um, one question that we received is around how to um, support commu communities in building support uh, around local 
using local media and successful narratives. And if that's something that, um, that you can speak to, especially when there have been, you know, um, articles or, or news pieces that have been um, disparaging or, you know, anti um, receiving or anti welcoming. Is there anything that you can equip audience members with? You know, just really quickly, I wanted to say that the Welcome with Dignity uh, Coalition is now, I believe, 95 organizations from small groups at the border, you know, to uh, the Episcopal Church, uh, to large groups, Amnesty International. And, and I, I think that they're, they're, if people go to that website and sort of follow along, maybe tap into some of those groups that they could help um, help provide them with some narrative change materials, videos, and that kind of thing. I think the other thing too is that, you know, in some places immigration has been polarizing, right, and become political. And I think one area that um, appeals to everybody regardless, you know, political persuasion is kids, you know, and really talking about these kids as kids. I mean, some of them are just doing absolutely incredible things, you know, now that they're in a safe place and they're more settled. I always joke that I keep updating my resume because I'm going to be working for one of our clients, one of our clients one day because they're just so amazing. And so I think to the extent that we can really lift up their stories, you know, and talk about the individual kids because they're so compelling, you know, they are the person that you want to be living next door to you. You know, they're the person that you want in your school as being leaders to, you know, the other students at the school. And so I think that really helps kind of take the politics out of it and really brings it back to the kids themselves and highlighting their successes. Great, thank you so much. Are there any final thoughts um, that you all might have or would like to impart on the audience before we wrap up? Yeah, I would just, you know, just kind of to wrap up the last comment and address some of these comments coming in, you know, like I said at the beginning, the time that the, the kids are in federal custody is generally relatively short, you know, compared to the entire trajectory of their um, migration experience. And so I think to the extent that you're interacting with kids once they're in the communities, once they're living with a sponsor, once they're in schools, that's going to be the opportunity to really get to know them and to be able to lift up their stories as we're talking about the narratives. Um, and I think too, you know, making sure that we understand that these kids are ending up all over the country, right? So it's not just a border issue. You know, this is really kind of an all of America issue. Um, and so continuing to be able to raise that. And so people can understand that even if you live in Maryland or Iowa or North Dakota, you know, there's going to be kids who are there as well too. So it's something that should be important to them just as much as people who are living um, at the U.S.-Mexico border. I just offer that there are other resources, you know, we've been welcoming uh, children in this country for quite some time and, and there are narratives, firsthand accounts that people have written as adults about their experiences as children. And I know sometimes there can be access is limited and you can't always have the child be the protagonist in, in media coverage. But what's, what's important is to also think about other research that's been conducted, um, other reporting that's been done and thinking about creative ways to to connect with um, the viewer. Again, broadcast is particularly challenging, but I think print and radio and other forms may be ways to really help the, the audience connect with that human experience. We This is also a unifying uh, experience in that we've all been children and we've all, many people as adults have children. And so there's a different experience that can be connected to related to values and to things that we have in common versus what's different. And an opportunity to to really name it at times and say, uh, you know, we're not we're not choosing to play uh, with children. We want to recognize, you know, their inherent dignity, their humanity, and uplift that and and take the storytelling from there, um, just from the goodness of, of who they are as people and as members of our of our common community. Great. Thank you all so much. Um, I really want to thank you for being marvelous speakers, for being so thoughtful in your responses um, today. 
So as a reminder, the webinar has been recorded and in the coming days, you will receive a follow-up email with a link to the recording. If you have any questions, please contact us at george at welcomingamerica.org. Um, and we really encourage you all to keep in touch. Feel free to visit our website, email us at info at welcomingamerica.org um, and connect with us in any way that you see appropriate. Again, thank you so much to our speakers and thank you all for joining us today.